Um, tonight, though, we are, of course, here to celebrate the launch of Julian Guthrie's new book, Good Blood, A Doctor, A Donor, and the Incredible Breakthrough that Saved Millions of Babies. The book is just out today. Um, Publishers Weekly says Good Blood vividly captures the determination and commitment of her two main subjects. This is an inspiring and heartwarming story of a medical breakthrough. Uh, those two main subjects, of course, are Dr. John Gorman and James Harrison, who are both here with us tonight. Um, I do wish we were all able to meet in person, um, but I will say that this is perhaps the best part of doing events virtually. I think this, um, this meeting probably would not have been possible otherwise. Um, uh, so I'm going to introduce Julian, uh, uh, who will introduce Dr. Gorman and Mr. Harrison and tell you uh, more about the book. Uh, Julian Guthrie is a journalist and author based in the San Francisco Bay Area. She spent 20 years at the San Francisco Chronicle, where she won numerous awards and had her writing nominated multiple times for the Pulitzer Prize. She's the author of four previous books, including the bestsellers, The Billionaire and the Mechanic, and How to Make a Spaceship. I'm very happy to turn it over to you now, Julianne. Um, thank you so much for being with us and congratulations on the book. Thank you. Um, and it's great to see everybody joining for our virtual book launch party. Today is actually the day. And I feel like we all need creativity in our lives more than ever. And this is a truly inspiring, true story. Um, Evan, I have to say that my first book, this is book number five, which is kind of inconceivable to me, but my first book was called The Grace of Everyday Saints. And it was a really beautiful story set in San Francisco. And I was so nervous, my, um, my first, book talk that I ever did in my career was at Booksmith. And I remember over in the hate and I remember I was so nervous and I walked in and I was so happy to see, you know, um, a, a, um, a, you know, a decent sized crowd. And so thank you for your support from then to now, from times of normalcy to times of COVID. Um, what you do is very, very important. So we are I am excited to shine the spotlight on this amazing story and the incredible stars of the book. There are many, but there are two main figures, Dr. John Gorman, who is joining us from Southern California, and James Harrison, who is otherwise known as the man with the golden arm, who is joining us from New South Wales in Australia where it is uh, already Wednesday morning, I think around 1115. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to show a very quick uh, under two minute video, which is will give you an overview of the book. And then I'm going to come back and I'm going to launch into questions. We're going to have a great discussion. Again, send your questions in the chat. Uh, we'll leave, leave room at the end uh, for your questions. And I also want to give a shout out to a few people who are joining my editor, uh, Jameson Stoltz at Abram, Abrams, we've had and his whole team, which is amazing. Uh, Jameson and I have worked on two books together. The other was The Billionaire and the Mechanic. I want to give a shout out to my agent, uh, Joe Veltri, who's a dear friend and has seen me through all of these books uh, from book one to book five. And I saw my editor Another editor, a dear friend, David Lewis online. So thank you for joining and thank you for um, helping me to become a better writer with, uh, with each endeavor. They're all crazy endeavors and, uh, and they're all so rewarding. So anyway, grateful to be here, excited to be with all of you in this virtual launch. I am going to uh, share this trailer with you. Here we go. And it is quick. I hope you enjoy. How is it possible that one humble man who worked as a bookkeeper for the railway in Australia saved the lives of more than two million babies? And how did a shy young doctor in New York City come up with an idea that would become one of the greatest medical breakthroughs of the 20th century? These questions are at the heart of my new book, Good Blood, the story of the race to cure a blood disease called RH that stalked families and caused a mother's immune system to attack her own unborn child. 
It begins in 1951 in Sydney, Australia, when James, age 14, received life-saving blood transfusions, something that would alter his very chemistry. A few years later and a half a world away, John Gorman, that shy doctor at Columbia University, landed on his idea for a breakthrough to this disease. It was an unvaccine, he liked to say, and it was beautiful in its simplicity. The only problem? No one thought it would work. These two men had no idea how their lives would intersect to solve a global medical mystery. John Gorman was kind of this mad scientist tinkerer. James Harrison became irrefutably the world's greatest blood donor. The story takes readers from Australia to America, from research labs to hospitals, and even into Sing Sing prison where these experimental blood trials were held. It's complete with a daring transcontinental shipment of this experimental drug that broke all the rules. Good Blood is about the progress and pitfalls of medicine and about the everyday heroics that fundamentally have changed the health of women and babies. It's a reminder for our times that many great things start in tragedy. In this case, a researcher lands on a crazy idea and a railway worker finds he has almost magical blood. I love this story and I hope you will too. So I get emotional looking at that one of those final photos every time. So um, I love this story, as I said, and let's jump into this. So the story opens with James as this young boy and you meet this rambunctious kid who always wants to be out in the street playing cricket with his mates but he is more often than not, he is sickly. Then by the time he's a teenager, he ends up in the hospital gravely ill. He has bronchitis, which turns into pneumonia. And he requires a very perilous uh, blood transfusion or surgery that requires multiple blood transfusions. And it really sets him on this journey in ways that no one could have predicted. Um, James, when you got out of that surgery, I think it was 11 or 12 hour surgery in 1951, um, your, your father said something to you that day in the hospital. What was that and, and how did you respond to that? Uh, my father was a blood donor. And he said that my life had been saved by blood donations from people not known. And I thought, well, I, the least I could do, and probably only a throwaway line at 14 years of age, was as soon as I was old enough, which was 18, I would become a blood donor and give something back, which I did. You certainly did. And you did again and again. And we're going to talk more about that. I want to read because this is a reading. Uh, I'm just going to read one paragraph at the end of that chapter um, that I particularly love. And so this is, this is when James's father um, told him, you were saved by the blood of strangers. You would have died without the gift of blood. And James knew that his father, as James just said, was a regular blood donor with a sense of responsibility that belied his daredevil acts. James told his family, I will return the favor. No one could have known that day in 1951 how true that was. The transfused blood that saved his life was altering James's very chemistry, mobilizing his antibodies, changing him at a molecular level, and creating a life force for others. So now I want to move um, back to John. So when we meet John Gorman in chapter two, he is 24 years old. It's 1955. He is coming into, from Australia, uh, into New York Harbor aboard the Queen Mary. And he's really arriving in America to make his name as a doctor, to see how he can stack up 
in this land of opportunity. Um, so John, talk a little bit about that period where you started in pediatrics in the Bronx, and then when you moved to uh, Columbia Presbyterian, and what you learned about yourself as a young resident at the time. Well, uh, the first thing I'd like to say is how great it was working with you and Julian. Uh, I, I was, it was really a pleasure. And uh, Thank you. the most impressive thing was that, that, that you, you're up to speed almost immediately with the technical stuff. You were, you were you like were, my professor. It was. I didn't have to. Uh, I just tell you once and you understood. It was wonderful. Uh, but uh, no, but uh, coming to, uh, I, I was really very excited about coming to America when I was 24. Uh, uh, at that time, I think I got into this, uh, America to me at that point was the most interesting country in the world. It seems to me that that's where all the action was. And, and I knew this as a teenager. Uh, at, at home, we had uh, subscription, well, not a subscription to the Saturday Evening Post and the Ladies Home Journal, Reader's Digest. And then uh, my cousins had Time and Life magazine and Newsweek. We even had the Atlantic and, and the New Yorker. I think people would be surprised that Australians would uh, have that much access to, uh, of course, we had the movies too, the American movies. But anyway, what happened was uh, I graduated from University of Melbourne Medical School in uh, 53 and then spent uh, time with my parents. My parents were GPs in uh, and had a practice, busy practice, so I worked with them. And uh, then uh, I did a, a residency, an internship. Now, at the internship, uh, three of my friends, uh, we decided that we would, we would go to New York, but to get a job in New York, a New York hospital. And, and um, so, so uh, I got we applied for jobs, and I got a job at St. Francis Hospital in the Bronx, 40th Precinct, which is one of the still bad precincts in, in New York, bad numbers. But uh, I was the chief resident, and um, and that was a very good experience. But my my idea was that I'd uh, spend a year in America and then go to England and then go back to Australia. But uh, at the end of the first year in, in the Bronx, I, I decided that uh, a year of pathology would be really good. And so I was very lucky to, uh, to get a job at, at, at Columbia Presbyterian. I was, I was in the, the Delafield Hospital, which cancer hospital for two years, and anatomic and then clinical pathology. During clinical pathology, I... Uh, rotated through the hematology, microbiology, uh, blood banking, chemistry, and, and I just fell in love with blood banking. So, so that's how I got interested or involved with the RH disease because at, at that time, uh, RH disease was a big concern of the blood bank. We, we had to uh, run all the tests on the RH negative mothers and we had to find blood for the exchange transfusions and uh, so, but I found blood banking totally fascinating. Well, and uh, John, you got to go in uh, a bit later. You didn't have to go in on the weekends, I believe. And you had learned something, I think, that was also defining when you were at um, St. Vincent's, where, you know, you coming from Australia, you were used to, um, it was a place where, as you characterized it, patients weren't constantly questioning uh, doctors and their decisions, and then you get to America and you're, you know, treat, you're in pediatrics and the moms or the dads, the parents, you know, would question your every decision. And at the time, you were a shy, you know, you were a shy young man, and uh, it seemed as though you loved, you know, working in a lab, you loved the research part of it, you, you, you have the mind of an innovator and an inventor. But I think it, your story is very interesting in terms of medicine, and there are all different um, types of um, heroes in medicine, whether those on the front lines or those working in the research labs, um, those working with patients. But I think your time working with patients was very short-lived. 
after you had that experience in the Bronx. Um, so going back, we'll come back to that. So James, um, how, so when you started donating blood at age 18, which was the legal age, right, in Australia, were you anxious? Were you apprehensive about that? Not, not really. Uh, I'm a bit, a bit anxious for the first needle, but when I found that was of no... Uh, uh, didn't hurt. Uh, I kept going, and, uh, and if, if the blood bank kept saying, "We need blood donors. We need blood donors," and uh, yeah, so after the first one, it was open go, no problems. Well, it's um, it's amazing to read that I, you know, in researching this book, I read that um, someone needs blood every two seconds. Uh, 4.5 million Americans alone need blood transfusions each year. Um, but you are interesting because you, uh, when you commit to something, you go all out. And for those uh, who are attending today, I went to visit James in Australia last summer. Um, and so I, I really saw, you know, whether it's his port wine collection, whether it's his pug figurine collection, whether it's his bromeliad collection in the backyard, or certainly, you know, at a whole different level, uh, his dedication to donating blood. But where does that come from in you? This, once you say you're going to do something, you go all out. That, that is true. I, I'm a firm believer that if you're going to be in something, you've got to be right in. So that's why I would take uh, president or secretary or treasurer of the organisations and uh, uh, we had no problems, and uh, I was just things came easy. I, right from the, I became in, a member of Apex in early years, and we ran street stalls calling for blood donors, and that just sort of kept us uh, excited. And uh, we signed up people, and some of them kept going, others dropped out, unfortunately. We got, uh, they can't make blood in a test tube. That's the trouble, and uh, we need humans out there to make the uh, donation uh, to, to keep the country going. That's right. Um, so John, what was the state of blood science in terms of, and research, like transfusions, testing, risks to donors like James? Um, of, there was no test for hepatitis. What was the testing like in those days? Uh, for, for, for hepatitis. Yeah, for, for, for blood testing. Oh, oh well, uh, <clears throat> that was actually, Joy, that's the interesting part. It was the, uh, the, the blood banking was, was really in a, still in a stage of development. I feel like I was in the early stages of it where uh, the, the testing got better and better. And, and uh, uh, we saw, for instance, we collected blood in, in, in glass bottles and, and uh, we moved to plastic bags. And, and that, so you can I go back to the early stages of blood bank. But Columbia Blood Bank was the fifth blood bank in the world. And it started by Dr. Scudder, who was my blood bank director. Uh, now, we, we, uh, we didn't have a test uh, for hepatitis, but we knew, we certainly knew we were giving a lot of patients hepatitis. Uh, and and uh, then, uh, no, it was just a fascinating time where, where, where and the, the American Association of Blood Banks was just being started and, and, and the amount of activity and interest in, in blood banking was, was thrilling. I remember going out to the, the ABB meeting in Chicago, which is, I was at the Edgewater Hotel. I thought this was fantastic, yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, so I wanted to step back for a moment because I was so charmed by the stories of your childhoods. Um, so James, talk a little bit about uh, when you were kind of a, a wild young boy and, and set loose on the streets of, um, of Juni. What was your town like and what was your family life like? I wouldn't have been wild 75 years ago. <laughs> no, country towns were country towns. Uh, probably like your out west uh, type country town. But uh, we had the schools, so we had high school, uh, we left school, uh, we, we worked. But we, in, during the day we played uh, cricket in the, out on the street because there weren't many cars in those early days. And uh, as we grew up, and uh, 
We, I, I, I played football in the winter and tennis in the summer and cricket in the summer. Well, in Juni was a big railway town and your father was a, was he a mechanic uh, on yeah. the railway? He was, yes. He was on the railways, yes. And you have one sister, one sibling, one sister, right? One, one is a younger sister, yes. Okay. Um, and then talk about how you decided to go into the railway um, as your vocation, as your job. Well, it was uh, an easy thing to do because I passed the entrance examination for the public service, the banks and the railway. But the railway was the only one that didn't work Saturdays. And I played sport on Saturdays. So the other two had no chance. And so I joined the railway in a clerical position and worked my way up from there. And you've told me that it was a great job. It kept the wolf from the door. It, it provided, it brought, it paid for your life and uh, comfortable life. And again, kept the wolf from the door. I think that was your saying. That's true. That's true. Uh, I, I had a wife at that time. I was a high school teacher. So that helped keep the wolf from the door as well. Um, so, John, um, talk about your childhood in, in, uh, in Bendigo and Rochester a little bit about your family life and maybe the, the um, garage or the shop where you and your father worked on projects? Yes. Um, I, I was born, <coughs> I was born in Melbourne, but I lived in uh, a, a, a town about 100 miles north of Melbourne was a, um, was a market town in the center of an agricultural district and uh, very prosperous, well-organized town. And the, uh, the, uh, my parents were general practitioners. They both uh, practiced uh, in, uh, and uh, so, so uh, to the age of 10, uh, uh, it was really, uh, I was just a kid, I guess, for 10 years, but, but then at, at that point, we moved to Bendigo. Bendigo was a much larger city, 30,000 people. And that's where gold was discovered in Australia uh, in 1851. So uh, the, the, the town was a much bigger. It was 80,000 people during the gold rush and, and it was, uh, was built up to quite a degree with big buildings and, and very, very nice. Uh, so, so I really spent the years in Bendigo uh, from 10 to 14 in World War II. Of course, I, the, 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 uh, the, uh, uh, the only thing I can remember about was the rationing. <laughs> but uh, it, 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 uh, and then at the last, I went down to Melbourne to boarding school for two years. Uh, and I think I could say that um, uh, but, but I got tremendous teaching. Well, my father was spent a lot of time uh, teaching me and getting me interested in all kinds of scientific, scientific stuff. Uh, I was uh, uh, an expert in chemistry, I think, at, at one point. Uh, but, uh, Mad scientist, did you ever blow up anything inadvertently? Yeah, and then I guess the other thing I did was I got into electronics. Uh, I was building radios and, and uh, hi-fi amplifiers, and I had kind of a workshop um, that, I, that I played around. I got pretty good at vacuum tubes, I must say. It's well, I'm convinced that's why you liked the pathology lab uh, at Columbia so much. It reminded you of that. So, John, yeah. um, will you explain to people in a very understandable way what RH disease is? because we have the privilege today of so many people not knowing what it is because of what you all have done. But step back and kind of define what it is and help people understand what a big, big problem it was globally. Yes, well, <clears throat> RH disease of the, of the fetus and newborn, uh, you, you have to go back to uh, the, the old days when uh, you had a perfectly healthy mother, RH negative. Everything is going well. The next thing, the baby's stillborn and edematous, and uh, the fetus is edematous, and, and uh, uh, it was quite mysterious. But nobody knew what was going on. 
then it was found that this on, <coughs> only occurred in Irish negative models. Uh, Phil Levine and, and, and uh, figured out that, that the Rh negative mother was getting. What happens is that the Rh negative mother blood crosses over the placenta from the baby, from the Rh positive baby, and then the Rh positive cells are an antigen, uh, and they cause the mother to make Rh antibodies. Now, those antibodies cross back across the placenta into the baby, and they attack the baby's red cells. So the baby becomes anemic, or the fetus becomes anemic. The fetus goes into heart failure, the fetus gets edematous, and, and the liver swells up to enormous size, and, and then the baby may die. If the, if the baby's born, uh, they, they get jaundiced, because the, because, uh, so, so they need exchange transfusions. Now, this was, a, was really a major problem for perinatal, neonatal, uh, perinatal mortality. And, and uh, we're really, uh, it's, it's pretty good, amazing, really, that, that, that the Rogam uh, was able to prevent this disease. It's, it's basically totally gone away now. Uh, <clears throat> so um, just, just kind of a step back a little bit more. Um, in the United States, I think at the time, in the late 50s, I came across a statistic that there were 250,000 babies dying each year uh, from, uh, from RH. And globally, obviously, that number is, uh, is much more significant. And in Australia, the um, incidences were even higher. It was affecting something like one in six babies. Uh, so it was a it was a global um, problem, and people didn't. There was no treatment for it at all. Uh, there was there began to be some medical interventions, um, but I want to kind of move ahead and uh, John talk about this breakthrough that really came from reading this copy of General Pathology, which was given to you by a salesman at the in the lab uh, at Columbia. And you were reading about antibodies and came across this sentence, and I'll read it. The presence of circulating antibodies, whether produced actively or received passively, depresses and may completely inhibit the immune response to the relevant antigen though not to other antigens. And you later tied this work, this to the work of Theobald Smith, who in 1909 was studying the diphtheria toxin and antitoxin. So talk about how it was this, um, it was obvious to you that this was going to work. So bring us into your thinking at the time. Yeah, well, I, I, I was really in a good position because uh, in the blood bank, this was a major concern. You know, we were getting blood for the babies and testing the mothers and uh, uh, all the time. And, and so was, it was obvious that the, the, some way to prevent the disease happening would be, would be would very worthwhile. And, and uh, so, yes, I was reading the Flory's textbook and, uh, uh, and the chapter where they describe the phenomenon. The phenomenon is that if you give passive antibody, in other words, you inject the antibody, they were doing it with diphtheria toxin back in 1908. So the phenomenon was found then. Uh, and give the passive antibody, and then the active antibody cannot stop the immune response. So, um, uh, so this was clearly laid out in that chapter. It's just it was a phenomenon that they described, and they they had they went back to references. Anyway, if you read the literature, it went back to 1908. They knew this with diphtheria toxin, and then the people people making the tetanus vaccine, tetanus antibody, they saw it, and then the polio people saw it. So. And then there were even at that point some experiments uh, where people in, in mice and rabbits were showing the passive antibody worked. Uh, now, it, it, it was almost 
instantly obvious to me that this this would fix would prevent the Rh negative mother from from getting sensitized. And then, then of course, uh, the, the wonderful thing was that uh, Vince Fred, Dr. Freda, was an obstetrician, and and he 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 came up to the blood bank and he made us go through all the records of Rh negative mothers. We had a big file cabinet and. And we got somebody, one of the girls, to go through and, and take all the data off these cards. And so we, we uh, Vince was, he kind of dedicated his career to the RH disease. And so he, uh, he uh, bought the, the idea right away and got very enthusiastic. And the next thing that happened was we had Bill Pollock came in to give a lecture one day from Ortho. And so we talked to him and he bought the idea um, so something got started. Now, I know that if it was just me, nothing would have ever happened. You, you know, if you have an idea, but it doesn't mean anything unless you've got people. First of all, someone's got to sell the idea to somebody. And then somebody's got to go through all the innovation that's necessary. Now, here it wasn't a, a, such a big deal because... Um, we, we knew how to uh, collect antibodies and ortho had, ortho had uh, freezers full of frozen antibody. And, and so Bill uh, uh, took RH antibody from the freezer and made it into RH immune globulin. Uh, now the source material, uh, James, this is exactly what James uh, contributed. Uh, you'd have to take the plasma from someone who's got high titers of RH antibody and fractionate it into gamma globulin. Uh, so, so uh, uh, at present, it just, it, they, they don't know how to make recombinant uh, RH antibody that works in mothers. It's very good for reagents, but it doesn't work in mothers. No. So, uh, so I, I just talk about James a little bit. James, uh, what James does, did for so many years, uh, contributed to the plasma, which had very high titer RH antibody. So the a small amount of James's plasma would make a lot of doses of, of RH immune globulin. Uh, uh, and the thing about it is too that I, you showed them on the video, but I saw them before the, the titers in James antibodies were tremendous. Uh, so he, not only did he give a lot of plasma, but he gave extraordinary valuable plasma. Uh, and I just, James, I want to say that uh, how many donors is it going to take to replace you? <laughs> I can never be replaced. <laughs> I, I, read, I was looking at the Sydney blood bank on Google. I read 200 donors. <laughs> but anyway, but for, I guess fortunately they they've they have other people that can can fill in for you, right? Oh, they would. They would. Um, so before we, um, I want to come back to James in a moment. Um, John, quickly, how did the idea for, there are a lot, there are a lot of really wild uh, parts to this story, unexpected things that could never happen today. Um, John, how did the idea come up for the trials at Sing Sing? And then when did you know that, that these trials were working? Because even though you had this idea for using these an passive antibodies, um, others were very uh, skeptical at best that this would actually work and they were worried that taking the antibodies uh, and injecting women with the antibodies would actually harm them, do harm. So trials at Sing Sing, and when did you know that it was working? You, you believed it would, but then you started seeing the numbers. Yes, well, well uh, the, the, it was it's very fortunate that we, we at first we, we didn't want to give the RH antibody during pregnancy because it would it could cross the placenta and, and cause the disease itself. And uh, it turns out that that's not a problem at all. That the dose that's able to prevent the, the antibodies is harmless to the baby. So you can give it during pregnancy as well as uh, at delivery. Now that's become completely routine now. I mean, it's, it's absolutely standard. 
to, to test the mothers for RH, the RH negative, test the baby and make sure that they get the, the RH immune globulin. <clears throat> uh, and how did you come up with the idea for Sing Sing prison, testing on experimenting with the, the volunteer uh, prisoners there? The which one? About Sing Sing. What was the idea oh, of? Oh, Sing Sing? okay. Yeah. Well, that was <laughs> one of the things I regret is that you know we we had the idea in, in 1960, and and uh, it didn't get licensed until 1968. So there's something that could have been done almost immediately. It took eight years. Uh, which, which, which I think. Talk I don't about Sing Sing. What? Talk about Sing Sing. I know, I'm, I'm talking about Sing Sing. I got a prompt to hear, but <laughs> <laughs> I've got to tell everybody how wonderful Julia is. Oh, here we go. She's okay. in the book, too. Anyway, so, so, so uh, yeah. Well, the, the, that brought up the idea. Well, what they, they said was that. Uh, everybody said that you can't start this in, in RH negative mothers. Uh, you have to see that it works in, in, in RH negative men. So uh, Vince uh, Freda got, uh, he spent a year in Albany getting permission from the governor, but then we got permission to go up to Sing Sing. And I think that's something that wouldn't happen today. You wouldn't pick on, on prisoners anymore. You've got to have a, a real, uh, they, they were volunteers, but <laughs> and they weren't given any compensation or anything to, to do it. So they were wonderful. But uh, so what we did was we, we gave, we had 36 prisoners, 18 uh, got RH positive cells like James and the other 18 did not. And we looked to see what kind of antibodies we got. And the ones, all the ones that did not get the, uh, half of them are given RH immune globulin, the other half were not. The ones that did not get the RH immune globulin made tremendous antibodies. Uh, the, and all 18 of the ones that, that were protected, none of them made antibodies. So we had 18 to nothing perfect uh, prevention of, of antibodies in RH negative men. And then we saw no side effects at all uh, in any of them. So uh, they all got red cells. Uh, so at this point, events became willing to start the trial in RH negative mothers in his clinic at Columbia. And, and so now, of course, the other side of this coin is Liverpool. Uh, we, 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 you know, we had the idea in New York and then Liverpool had gotten exactly the same idea quite independently from us. And so they started a, they started a program they also started, I, I think, in prisoners, and uh, and uh, and we we we. I was in Liverpool, and they were in New York, so we were pretty close and very friendly with Liverpool. But there was there was a certain rivalry between the two groups uh, to see who who would get credit credit for it. Uh, for the Spurs, yes, the Liverpool uh, group. Um, they used uh, volunteer policemen for their trials. And then there was also amazing work being done in Canada by um, uh, Alvin Zakursky and uh, elsewhere. But this, there was the, this was a um, this was something that needed to be solved. This was a global problem, and there were these brilliant minds working on different continents, really to try to solve this. So, James, um, you had been donating blood for more than 15 years. I think before it, before this uh, potential breakthrough, before the news of it reached Australia, really. But once um, word got out that the use of these passive antibodies to treat RH was working, um, you were uh, called in to, I think, the, um, the director's office and by Ro with Robin Barlow, who became a great friend. And it was a great group of people at the Sydney Blood Bank and uh, Robin Barlow and Nurse Lizzie Tyne. Um, but you were called in to Dr. I think Archer's office with Robin and told at the time or asked if you would become a part of this new donor program. What do you remember about that meeting and about, about RH, learning about RH? Uh, well, I reckon that Robin was a better looker than uh, Mr. Archer. So uh, she was the receptionist there and uh, knew probably more about uh, 
blood than uh, even the professors. But uh, no, it was uh, quite a, a good meeting. And uh, uh, the thing was that, as it was new in Australia, uh, that they explained exactly what the end result would be. And they would insure me for, I think, $500,000 uh, in case something happened. But I think that lapsed that policy after about two donations because uh, my wife was quite happy that I get the, the reward, but I beat her there and uh, uh, we, we, we just kept going. And uh, because it was so necessary and because they said it was going to save the saved babies, uh, I just kept going. And I, whenever I travelled, I would go and donate uh, at, at any uh, place that had the equipment to take plasma. So it brings it tears to my eyes your dedication, truly, because when you started, I think you were going every six weeks um, and yeah. then down to four weeks and then three weeks and two weeks and then once a week and you would you would take time off from work and then so you would work late at night. Um, it really, uh, really just an incredible story of commitment on your part. Um, what did the numbers, when you started reaching these milestones, like 100 donations, 500 donations, 1,000 donations, which I think you did with your grandson, he was donating for the first time and you were donating blood for the 1,000th time. So what did those milestones mean to you? Uh, they were just numbers, really. Uh, I wasn't you know, doing things for ego or anything like that. But, uh, they just sort of roll, rolled in and rolled in. And because of my work, I could make my own arrangements to donate and I would catch up on what I'd, I'd missed out during the work hours. And of course, when on holidays, I would be caravaned around the country and I'd stop at any place within a week or two weeks. Sometimes it was four weeks before I could get to a, one that had the equipment. Uh, sometimes it was once a week. But about 15 or 16 different locations I donated plasma. So. Yeah. Well, was, there were also yeah. incredible women who had suffered greatly and suffered great losses uh, with RH and had, you know, eight, nine, 10, 11 miscarriages because of RH disease. And they were amazing. They became amazing donors because they had those same antibodies that, that were the antibodies that harmed and um, killed their, their unborn children, but they were the antibodies that were harvested to protect other women. Um, and there was one woman whose story is told in the book, Olive Semler. Do you remember Olive? Uh, only vaguely. That's yeah. a long time ago. Long I know, time ago. I know. I always ask these questions of decades ago. Um, but in terms of, um, you know, when it really hit home for you, James, was, um, this moves forward a little bit, but when your own daughter uh, needed this to protect your unborn grand grandson, uh, what was that like? I mean, that, that, oh, that yeah. That, that was fantastic that the, the, the uh, I, I could do something uh, because it, she, she was a good girl and uh, we had first child's quite normal. And that's where I don't differ from John, but we were always told that if the mother was ne negative and the partner was positive, uh, that's when problems started. So that when she had the first child, she had to get an injection of anti-D, which would kill the nasties that she released into her system and she could conceive again. And I met a number of women, they usually have two pr pr um, miscarriages, one miscarriage, and then they go on and harvest one, had 13 children. So had, uh, that anti D, antibodies <laughs> worked well there. Yes, once, uh, you know, if they were protected in time. Um, John, why do you call this an unvaccine or the anti vaccine? That's why do you call these an unvaccine? Well, normally a vaccine uh, is used to create, produce, or stimulate antibodies that will protect you against the disease, the bacteria, or whatever the disease is. Now, what 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 RH immune globulin does is it, it prevents the immune response. So instead of causing an immune response, it stops the immune response, and that's uh, that's what. Um, 
you know, the passive, that, that's what like, was the elephant in the room. But the, 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 it was well known for 50 years that passive antibodies could do this. And, and uh, we, we were just lucky, I think, that we figured out that uh, this RH disease was a perfect, perfect target for it. It, it really has, a, it's used for a thrombocytopenia, but it, has, it doesn't, it's not used for any, any other disease. I, I, I guess you don't want to stop antibodies. You really want antibodies most of the time. So before we're going to, um, by at the end of this, I want to ask, come back and ask John before we um, sign off about, um, about parallels to COVID, but we're going to come back and his ideas around what's coming down the pipeline. Um, so the, uh, the uh, this was approved for use in the night uh, in the United States in the spring of 1968. And John, you and Bill Pollack, I believe, yes, you went on the Today Show. You were interviewed by Barbara Walters and Hugh Downs, and uh, became something of a celebrity at the time. Uh, but there's a there's a story if you could tell uh, quickly here. It's such an amazing story <clears throat> of Four years before this was approved for use, your sister-in-law received this transcontinental shipment uh, that would never work today. Uh, but it, it, just just talk about that if you would. Yes. Well, what, what happened with my brother Frank, his wife? Uh, Frank was uh, working in England in, in a hospital in Essex, and. Uh, Kath was was pregnant, and my dad, uh, who followed everything along, said that she obviously needs this RH immune globulin shot. So you better get get it to her. And it wasn't licensed or anything at that point. Uh, that was four years before it was licensed. And uh, however, we we had been had been using it in the mothers at Columbia, uh, getting a study started. And they were uh, now so. So remember, I think Vince and I uh, actually took it out to Kennedy Airport and, and got it on a B British Airlines VOAC flight. And Frank was to pick it up at, at Heathrow. And, and he did. We had it probably in a little plastic uh, box with ice. But, um, so, but when he got to the hospital in Essex, the, uh, the blood banker there uh, was very, very cautious about administering it to cats. Uh, it was a new drug, it wasn't licensed, etc., etc. So he called Liverpool and, and said, what about using it? And um, they said, they gave the okay, which I thought was very, very, very nice of them, very generous of them, because it ended up that the first person in England got our stuff instead of theirs. But, but they were very gracious about it. And now <laughs> Go ahead, John. Sorry. Yeah, she, she went on to have uh, five more. Six, six, six more, eh? Five more, yes. Five, five more orange positive babies, and none of them were sensitized. So, so that was that was that was a very positive outcome. I should say so. So, um, John, you along with the team from Liverpool. Uh, and Vince Frieda at Columbia, you were in 1980 awarded the Lasker Prize for medicine uh, for this breakthrough. Some say you should have won a Nobel Prize for this work, but can you summarize the effectiveness of the treatment today, whether by who, the World Health Organization or others? Yes, it was, it was, it was pretty nice to get the Lasker Award, uh, Julia. So. Okay. <laughs> Did you understand that? Yeah. Okay. Do you want you to talk about what, what its relevance is now as far as World Health, you know? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yes. <coughs> uh, the, the, well, uh, it's now rog ROGAM or Irish Moon Global is now totally standard and uh, it's, it's, it's totally virtually eliminated the, the disease and when it's used properly. It's, it's still a big problem in the developing world, but, but in, in uh, advanced countries, the, the disease has just gone. So, so that's, that's a wonderful feeling, I guess you can imagine that. Uh, that, uh, that uh, didn't the World Health Organization uh, say that, that it's, mm -hmm. didn't, the, did, didn't the World Health Organization declare that it's um, the most uh, cost-effective and the most efficient oh, yeah, uh, yeah. treatment number one in the world? 
Yeah, that's a nice thing, actually. The, the World Health Organization has a list of uh, essential medicines. And, and because of their, their, their safety and effectiveness, anyway, our immune globulin is number one on their list. <laughs> so that's, 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 that's very nice. The other thing is about it is it's the most cost-effective medicine ever developed in terms of qualities. Now, qualities are qualified uh, life years, number of life years, uh, call the healthy life years that you get after the treatment. Now, with the expensive uh, 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 drugs for cancer and stuff, they're very expensive and they may add another 12 months or two years or something. Now, we, we had a big advantage that we added 80 years to the baby's life with, with the dose if, if you prevented them, uh, the, the mortality. So th that number isn't really, but, but, but it's way ahead of every, every other drug. Um, so it is, a, it is something that has been solved that people don't know about today in first in developed countries because it's so routine, which is, which is the, the beauty and the brilliance of this. But um, there's a group at Columbia led by um, Steve Spitalnik, who I think is joining us, who is working on getting this um, awareness and this um, treatment to women in developing countries. Um, I was told that just 50% of women at risk for RH disease each year are receiving the anti-RH injections they need. Some 2.5 million women in need are not receiving any treatment at all each year. So it's a war that is still being waged. Um, James, I want to ask you one question, then we'll talk with John about COVID, and then we're running out of time. But James, um, May 18th, 2018, you were retired um, from donating blood at age 81. And that must have been quite a day for you. Talk about that a little bit. Uh, it was quite, uh, I could say, traumatic to that degree because I'd been there for so long and I'd met so many different people and got to make friends with a lot of them, especially the staff. And on the final day, when they put a party on for me, mothers and babies all turned up, or well, not all the mothers, but about a dozen or so uh, mothers turned up with their uh, you know, young babies. And uh, it nearly brought a tear to my eye, maybe it did bring a tear to my eye, but uh, no, it, it was uh, very, uh, 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 it's great, it's great. Sad, but uh, uh, time comes to everybody. You know, I started at 18, which was 1.8, and I finished at 81, which was 8.1. So uh, that, and, that was... And uh, so tell us the, the, the milestone that you walked out with that day, the number. 1,175 donations in the period from uh, when I was 18, back in 53, I think it was. 53. I think it was 1,173, and then you got two more, right? right? I don't want to have that oh, right. Right? 1,173. I've got another one coming up in a couple of weeks' time. They still oh. want to keep getting samples for uh, testing. So, uh, yeah, it's just so, so you got the moniker, you got the name, the man with the golden arm. Um, can you show us that right arm where you <laughs> gave blood 1,100 and how many times from your right arm and how many times from your left? 1,163 from my right arm and 10 from my left. Okay. And one of the nurses at some stage said, oh, here comes the man with the golden arm. <laughs> because I got the injection, got the blood out of the same arm time and time and time and time again. In fact, they were going to fit me with a shunt at one stage so I could just donate and send it in. But uh, <laughs> no, it was a bit too uh, risky that. Well, but, and the... No, red was... Sorry, go ahead. That's all right. No, it was... Uh, Easy to do. I was quite happy to do it. And the more you did it, the more you got used to it. And uh, that's all I could say is, is the, a donation of ordinary whole blood, those people out there, you save three lives just with one donation. And if you donate plasma, you can save 18 lives. And of course, if you've got the ATD, which, which eliminates the hemolytic disease of the newborn, gives those mothers who uh, have uh, had miscarriages and uh, such like, can then conceive normally 
And as I said, one had 13 and I've met a couple of had seven children since they uh, started getting the injections. Makes you feel good. It makes you feel really good. And uh, so 1,173 times and the Red Cross in Australia tabulated um, how many lives James Harrison saved with his acts of dedication and generosity. And that figure is 2.4 million babies. That this one man, I get emotional just saying this, that, that the lives that you saved and you know, the breakthrough that came from you know, these researchers, including you know, our brilliant John Gorman, but, and then the heart that you had to, and the dedication that you had is really unbelievable. So um, no small thing. So thank you uh, for, for that and for all of the lives that you saved. And I read that, or you told me um, that your, your anti-D, your antibodies were in every vial of the product made in Australia from the inception of the program until after you stopped donating. Is that correct? That's correct, yes. And it was just an amazing group, like you had a family um, away from your family there at the blood bank uh, with really incredible nurses and practitioners and I got to meet a few of them. So that was a pleasure. Um, John, how did, so explain quickly, how did James, is James get those antibodies in spade and how did they come back so many years later? And how does that apply to COVID? Um, oh, yeah, so there's a couple of points about COVID. Um, one is that, uh, as, and I think James is a good example. Uh, how many years, James, between the time you got your transfusions and then uh, they found the antibody and they started to stimulate you with Rh positive cells? I was operated on in 1951, yeah. and they, call, they called me into the office in 66, and I started donating the uh, anti D right. in 67. That's 15 years, right, I think. Okay, now, this is, this is what about the immune response doesn't go away. So as far as COVID's concerned, if you've got antibodies, you're going to be perfectly safe for many years. Uh, we, we know this from an example like James and also in the Rh negative mothers. If, if they get sensitized by a pregnancy 10 years later, that, that antibody is going to come back. So it's, it's pretty much, I think it's pretty much lifelong that the antibody will, be, will protect, protect you. Uh, and that's why uh, I think the vaccine, I think they're being way, way too conservative with the vaccine. I think, I think it should be given. Uh, they shouldn't wait for effectiveness. They should, as long as they know it's safe and that it makes antibodies, they should get it out there as fast as possible. Because the, the other side of the coin is, is uh, people like me and Julia are gonna die. Uh, <laughs> if we can't have it. <laughs> I'm so, nobody laugh at that, okay. Um, and so, and what about, what about the use of, um, of, of convalescent plasma for COVID and, um, and how, you know, everything that you know about immunology and learned about RH, where do you think we are with that? Yeah, well, convalescent plasma is a form of passive antibody, just like uh, RH immune globulin. And if, if, it's, if it's got the antibodies, it, it creates an instant immune response, like, within an hour or so, or even quicker after it's administered, the patient has, has got antibodies and, and should kill the virus. But the, the problem is that it, it would have to be given to work. It would have to be given very early before the virus has caused lung damage and so on. So, so uh, uh, I think with the, what will be even better than, than convalescent serum is the the synthetic antibodies being made by Regeneron and Lilly. I'm just, I'm just can't wait to hear that their study is just about, we'll, we'll have uh, data on that in the next week or so, I believe. And if that's given early, it should just stop COVID dead. Uh, that'll be the end of anything the virus can, more damage the virus can do. 
So it, it, the timing of that, I think, would be very critical. But it should be available too. They shouldn't be holding that up to wait <laughs> to see see another two or three months to see see if it works or something. They should just start using it. <laughs> so what's we'll we'll close we'll start winding down here, but. Um, I know that James, there's a program in Australia where it's called James in a Jar, where they are trying to synthetically replicate uh, the bounty of your blood. And, you know, it, po it, it, it presents the issue of uh, this still is man-made. You know, it's, it cannot be made in, in a laboratory, uh, but they're working on, on replicating your blood. I love the title of that, James in a Jar. Is it going to happen? Yeah. Well, who knows? We hope so. <laughs> we hope so that uh, some good comes from it, even though I'm not in there with my arm out every fortnight. Uh, I'm in the in the uh, the office down there, and uh, if they can find something, uh, I've got more more interviews coming up to uh, see some professors in Melbourne or talk to some professors. So who knows what might be happening? Well, we will stay tuned, and um, I just want to thank you both. Um, think about, you know, James's story to me is about um, what we all can do. We can all contribute something, and James told me, you know, he didn't have a lot of money to give. He didn't have a lot of whatever uh, power, whatever it was, but he had blood. He could roll up his sleeves, he could extend his arm, and he could give blood. And I think that's a really powerful message. And for John Gorman, uh, who's very much of an idea man, he um, likes to find uh, very simple answers to very complex problems. And he continues to come up with really innovative ideas um, today. So it was this combination that I think this story beautifully represents um, just some of the best qualities in humanity and then presents us with a very uplifting story um, about a medical breakthrough that became, again, one of the most effective, cost-effective uh, treatments in the history of medicine. So thank you all. Thank you for letting me tell your story. And it's been a pleasure tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Pleasure. <laughs> Say thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. I hope you love the book. Share the story. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you all so much for joining us. This has been wonderful. Um, thank you, uh, John and, and, and James and um, and Julian, of course. Thank you and congratulations on the book. Thank you. Um, Take care, everybody. Thank you all for joining us. Take care and be well. Bye. Bye. Bye.